Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Get Jashed. Today I have with me Dr. Hannah McDougall. Dr. McDougall is a dual Paralympian, a previous world record holder, bronze medalist, and has represented Australia in an international level since 2001 um, in swimming and cycling. So Hannah is also aiming to represent Australia at the Tokyo Now 2021 Paralympics as well. So thanks so much for joining me, Hannah. Thanks for having me, Jess. My pleasure. So as I explained to you before this, these, these conversations are really just talking about leadership and communication um, and sharing different perspectives and stories around that based on what your experience has been and what uh, or how that to just general experiences as well so um i think there's a lot to talk about your experience across the board um so we'll start with your leadership in captain so you were the australian swimming team uh captain at the world championships and paralympics is that correct yeah so one of the captains one. yes uh yeah. and it's quite ironic looking back at that now in that um, I was 17 for Beijing. Oh, wow. For those, when I was the, one of the captains there. And then for the world championships, uh, yeah, one year older. So, and I was considered a grandma on the swimming team because... 80% of us at Athens were under 18 and we were known as the preschoolers oh. uh, <laughs> within, within the Aussie team. So we were pretty fresh, um, but uh, yeah, it was, it was just a super honor to be, to be given that role. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the time, I don't think I was really too sure really why my peers had nominated me to that position until like later they were like, Han, you walk your talk in the sense of, you know, you're always showing up to training beforehand, doing your bloody TheraBand exercises till cows come home. Uh, we feel we can come up to you and you'll be able to listen and have, if you need to, a courageous conversation with our team managers, et cetera, et cetera. So kind of probably gain an insight after those positions rather than more during them as to to why we got in the first place but very very humbled um and it was a good team to lead so uh yeah how did you because because you were so young and because you were one of the younger um people on the team how did that feel how did that feel to communicate to others as a captain to sort of lead in that way when it came to speaking up um, did it feel, because a lot of people hold themselves back because they're like, oh, I'm younger than them, so I don't, um, I don't have as much to say or anything like that, which isn't necessarily true. So did you come up against any obstacles like that, even internally? I, I think probably more so internally. Um, there was a couple of girls who were older, me, uh, older than me, but as I mentioned, we were a, a very young bunch of swimmers. Um, so it was more, I mean, I still get nervous to this day when I have to have courageous or uncomfortable conversations with people, but I suppose now I've, I've learned more to lean into that, uh, rather than back then I'd, I'd rehearse it and I'd, you know, I'd write out all the possibilities and come up with all of these answers and solutions before I went into that. So I think I've changed in terms of that sense of the way I would now approach things. Because, um, yeah, I remember pissing my dacks sometimes before having to have a chat to the, to the head coach about different issues on the team, et cetera. So he was um, a pretty big influence in our lives. And uh, he, had a, he had a soft heart, but he was also very scary and strict. <laughs> And I love how you use the word used it a couple of times, um, like having courageous conversations. So I think that's a whole part of leadership. It doesn't mean that there's no fear and there's no like, oh, I don't know if I want to do this, but there's still courage. Like, and that's what, what makes the difference to me. Um, mm. Do you feel like you imparted that in, in example, like by showing that by example? I, 
probably more so recently than, than back then. And I love along my journey, I've learned that courage comes from the Latin word core, which means heart. So when I go into those conversations, I really do try and come from my heart space um, and, you know, become aware that I'm feeling nervous in my stomach or my heart rate started to increase. Um, but I'm also sitting in front of this person and they're just a person too. They need to go to the bathroom. They need to eat, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They bleed <laughs> just like we all do. Um, so I, uh, and I suppose I've transitioned a bit more into, uh, I think through my PhD and the work I did in motivational interviewing and learning to listen, to understand rather than listening to be able to say something really smart. <laughs> um, and I think there's been that growth in terms of still a long way to go, work in progress, but um, in the sense of it's okay to not have all the answers. Uh, and if you show up with that intention and hopefully, you know, working together in some type of dance when you are having those courageous conversations, um, it can be pretty magical and powerful. Uh, also recognizing the emotional energy and how much that can take after you. So it's almost like you've done a race and you need to warm down um, and recover with the right food, nutrition, sleep, et cetera, et cetera, because we're pretty good at, well, we're all right, actually. We've got a long way to go, but um, in terms of physical recovery, but for when we do a physical exertion, but we've got a long way to go in terms of recognizing the recovery that we do need for when we've had emotional exertion. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, my God. There's so much that you said that I'm like, yes, yes, all of this stuff. It's so good. It's just, um, and there is that element, and I think there is leadership, but even communication that can play a role in expressing that need even and leading from example as well. And you as an athlete would have been able to say, well, I need this for me. And then when people get, like when the other athletes get to see that, they're like, oh, well, wait a second, maybe I need that too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I want to go from there because you mentioned you did your PhD. Um, so you referred to yourself as a well-being pracademic, which I love. Um, but you did your PhD in athlete well-being. Um, I wanted to talk about leadership in para sports and how, especially from the athlete well-being side of things, how how important that has shown up in your work, but also in your experience. Yeah, it's. Uh, I feel like we we are kind of on the start of this exponential curve with respect to athlete well being and just well being in general. I know there's probably like a little bit of well being fatigue out there, um, and I totally appreciate that. When I first started looking into um, my PhD essentially came about because uh, I entered a competition through a newspaper, which was in 25 words or less, tell us about one of your happiest moments. And so I talked about um, the time that I went to Bondi Beach and I had a wet leg for the first time. And so for the first time in my life, I could walk into that ocean without having to use crutches, without having to get a piggyback or um, all of these things. And I, it was just freedom. Mm. And so I talked about that and I won tickets to the happiness and, and its causes conference. And at that conference, I heard from just these amazing researchers and scientists and um, Buddhist monks and artists and musicians and I was just I was like these are my people this is like my area that I want to get into um and so I was looking around and there wasn't really like a PhD in well-being per se there was not really some masters at the time there was one master's degree um who was it I think it was RMIT so it was like kind of ticked some of my boxes but not all of them 
Um, and so I'm like, okay, Hen, what do you do when you can't take a traditional route? You just make your own path, right? So I'm like, okay, <laughs> let's just do a PhD in this area um, because I wanted, uh, given my my upbringing and um, I like to be truthful in what I do. And so therefore I feel I do need that research and evidence to back up the practices that I teach other people um, rather than just a hocus pocus. I think this works. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Element of skepticism to it by saying, Hey, look, science. <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean, at that time, there was really nothing <laughs> in terms of a para para well being sport landscape at all. So we literally had to just start from scratch and say, well, this is work that's been done in a well being science sense. This is work that's been done in athletes who compete at the Olympic Games. Um, let's see what this concept means in terms of Paralympic sports space, let's explore it. How do we define it? How can we measure it? And then finally, that last piece was how can we improve it? Um, so that was the, the PhD journey uh, in terms of the well-being and um, seeing the growth in the past two years in that space in sport across the board uh, has been, makes my heart really sing. I feel we're still coming at it more so from a mental illness rather than a mental health perspective in terms of our approach. Uh, that's okay. Like we've got to start somewhere. Um, I think that so we can still make some really good steps in the future, uh, but there's been some really exciting stuff done recently. That makes me so happy to hear all about that. That's That's a really cool journey though of how you even – like got instigated into doing your PhD is just filling out this 25 words or less thing for a newspaper. And then all of a sudden it's just this life changing like journey. And I think that's like, aside from leadership and communication, I think that's really important for people to realize that yes, like change can happen through all the steps, but change can also happen through like the tiniest little decisions that you don't know what will come of it. And then all of a sudden, it'll just open up your world. And you're like, oh, hey, this is what I've been missing this whole time. What? It's just... <laughs> um, 100%. In addition to that, so you do a lot. Um, as you were talking, I was wondering how you <laughs> managed to be an elite athlete as well as um, do your PhD, as well as um, you are also senior advisor for community programs and campaigns with the Victorian State Emergency Service. Um, so when it comes to communication in that arena, in that way, because I imagine with SES kinds of services, communication is very, very key to um, not only training, but also delivering, especially when shit hits the fan and it's very needed um how does communication and leadership positions show up in that arena yeah so it's been i'm coming up to my two-year anniversary uh with ses vic ses uh i did finish my phd though before i started uh working with them so just to let's not you know have the sun shining out of my ass too much um, <laughs> but I, for me, what I've looked to do is to bring the experience from, um, from so many facets of my life in terms of the PhD, mindfulness, motivational interviewing, acceptance, commitment therapy, to look, to create change, uh, within the SES, in that community programs, community resilience, community engagement. Base. And we're looking to make a shift. Um, we've known since the 1980s that telling somebody what to do does not work. <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> and um, that plying them with reams and reams of information about all of, for us, our different hazards 
and the bazillions of action steps that you need to do to make you safe is probably, it might be helpful for you in terms of your knowledge and understanding, et cetera. But in terms of a community of resilience space, I think we can do a bit better than that in terms of employing those skills of, of listening and connecting and building rapport with people through, you know, the various body language, sitting back, um, you know, even simple stuff like making sure you don't have a table separating you. Um, and how you can smile with your eyes, etc. And so how we can kind of lead the way in that sense. Um, so what I've done is we've created a whole training course to support building skills and confidence around engagement um, for the volunteers. And we're about to, <laughs> we've run it with some staff um, and we had a lot of pilots and then programs lined up pre-COVID. <laughs> so we'll, um, we'll resume that rollout shortly afterwards. Uh, but I think just bringing to the table um, principles of remembering to keep it simple, because I know I'm my own worst enemy in terms of overcomplicating things. <laughs> um, and how can we you know, let's have one key message, one small key action step that can help people progress towards increasing their resiliency and in our, in our sense for emergency preparedness. Um, and then how do we measure that so that we can actually say we did that well or we didn't do it well. And so therefore we can have improvement. Um, so it's been a massive, massive learning journey and I'm, they've been so super supportive of me combining my sport with work uh, and all those other things. So, yeah, um, we're making progress, but change takes time. Because <laughs> you started, you started with the like people don't um, they don't respond to being told what to do, but they do respond to being shown what to do. Like when people lead by example, and it's it's not the first time that this has come up in one of these interviews, like the Get Jashed interviews that I've been doing, it's, it's kind of becoming a common theme of it's about building connection and rapport and that, that kind of element to then help people grow and expand from there or to communicate something really important as opposed to someone standing on a stage yelling at people, directing people and all of that. And it's just really interesting because that's something that's always been super passionate of like element of mine is to change the way that um that people in various types of power so whether it's in the athletes industry whether it's coaches or whatever or um corporates and executives and management changing the way that they relate to the people around them to then like sort of usher them along the way rather than directing them and then getting frustrated why it's not happening. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I love that you're all over that as well. It's just, uh, it's a relief almost. <laughs> it's, I mean, there's times when I just want to unwalk my talk and make my decision and it's going to be this way. And I'm like, Oh, and I just, I don't think we're going to get people to come along the journey with you if you do that. So, I mean, it's tough, like, and it takes a lot of energy. And as we said, time, um, but I think it's more sustainable, ethical, hopefully fruitful um, and has just better outcomes for, for everyone at the end of the day. I see it that way. Like it does take, communication and leadership it does take effort it's not saying um that it's easy necessarily sometimes it's really hard to be courageous and all of that but you're right i think it does it creates a more sustainable environment or relationship whatever that relationship is between player and coach or player and captain or captain and captain or um volunteers and people creating the programs for the SES, like all of that, it just creates more of a trust in the, in the end, like it builds a stronger foundation. Um, so where do you feel like, whether it's leadership or communication, where do you feel like you get it really right personally? Oh, 
I reckon that varies from day to day <laughs> uh, in terms of... Not that really right at least. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, hmm, good question. And everybody on the screen can tell I'm thinking because I'm doing that kind of eye up to some corner. I can't remember which corner it is. But <laughs> Uh, um, I'm going to just make, take a recent example because it resonates and, you know, your brain kind of, I'm sorry, I'm going a bit dark as well. Um, go, uh, you know, recency effect and the psychological thing, etc. There's some theory around it, but anyway. Um, so I'm part of the, the social committee at Vic SES, mm -hmm. um, and I haven't stepped it up into any official leadership roles uh, because I'm like, hand, plate's full, plate's full. <laughs> uh, we can't quite chew off anymore at this point in time. Um, but saying that when COVID hit and we had to start working from home and, you know, realising just how important it is to keep socially connected during these times of physical distancing. And so... Uh, I sent around a, an email to our committee and I asked them, I'm like, guys, you know, I think it's important we still keep connected. What can we do? I've got a few ideas in terms of maybe we can have a working from home photo competition. Um, I'm happy to collate all of these memes and videos that are coming around and send them off so that people can have a laugh. And then also uh, I'm happy to run a 15 minute mindfulness session for the staff um, once a week on a Friday at 12 o'clock. And so I, um, I, you know, they were, they were like, yeah, hand, sure, go for it. <laughs> and I was like, okay, okay, <laughs> I can do this. Um, so I think in terms of there was that leadership piece around, I'm very action orientated. I like getting stuff done. Um, it's like, what can I do right now to help? And I know how important social connection is. So, you know, let's make sure people are having a laugh. Um, but then what are my skills and strengths? And I'm like, okay, well, Hen, you are a qualified mindfulness teacher. So let's put that into play. Um, so, yeah, I think that example is a time where um, I filled a little bit of a, a gap and a need. Uh, it hasn't, you know, gone... It hasn't been crazy successful, but getting those emails from staff saying, thank you so much. That was, I've literally just pissed myself with laughter from some of the videos because people have been very creative, I have to say. Oh, yeah. uh, loved it. Absolutely loved it. Um, so, and then the communication piece around, well, what pieces of technology, how can we communicate? Um, but then using technology to, I love it, to, to, use, to bring mindfulness to them. Um, so that's just one example that does spring to mind. I think that's a good example. And I think it's, I asked that question because I think it's important to recognize where you do do things well, because then you can continue doing them on purpose as well. Um, so where do you feel like there's room for improvement for you personally? Um, well, let's just pause for one second. I'll turn a light on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, perfect. <laughs> Thought that could be helpful. <laughs> um, it's just, it's raining cats and dogs right now. Um, so where I could improve, uh, I mean, I, I've got a long way to go in my journey of the whole piece around listening to understand without listening to say what I want to say and get my point across. I don't quite literally have to bite my tongue physically, but it's close to it <laughs> um, because I'm a problem solver in some senses. Like I like helping people and how can we get from A to Z and take action where uh, it's a skill I'm learning is just to sit back um, and use those skills of inquiry reflection um, during those conversations to make sure that a person has felt heard. Uh, so that's that kind of big gamut is a is a work in progress. Um, as well as given my drive to move forward, um, my boss helps me to 
or just keep take that step back and connect the dots and to make sure we are connecting those dots rather than just going gung-ho like, yeah, um, here we go yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so in that sense to be a little bit more strategic um so yeah there are a couple of examples i can give you 10 more if you want <laughs> i'm sure a lot of people could do that for themselves as well like just sort of be like oh this is i need to get better at this and this and this but no that's awesome um so one more question where do you feel like there is room for improvement in your industry and you can choose which industry you decide to talk about <laughs> but around um, communication yeah yeah <laughs> i think like this pandemic has really shown what people value in their leaders mm -hmm. like i mean we've had fantastic examples of what i would perceive as uh, helpful leadership attributes and styles and outcomes and processes compared to people who are leaders but maybe perhaps only in title and yeah. I just can't understand what planet they're on. Um, so I think um, like what I've what's warmed my heart heart is I've seen that courageous leadership like we just have to look to beautiful New Zealand and Jacinta is smashing it out over there um I I don't envy and I'm really glad I'm not I'm not ScoMo right now um I I like in terms of I don't agree with all of his decisions but in terms of how he has you know he's been there he's made decisions which is great compared to what we've had for the past 10 years of everybody just piss fighting around um actually making decisions um and you know there's things we haven't got right things we have got right um so in terms of i think tying all of that together and then that what um this pandemic is helping to show us in terms of what is actually important in life Mm. And that we all need to lead and that importance of social connection through communication. So when we're actually with people, be with them. Don't multitask, um, you know, sit there and connect uh, and, and feel it with not only, um, not only see it with, you know, your visual perception, but feel it too with your body. Like I noticed you know, that, that lack of physical touch and then the, the research around the impacts on hormones that has and blah, 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 um, et cetera. So I think um, there's a massive opportunity for humanity collectively to learn from this. And I'm really hoping we do when we don't just resume to our individualistic consumeristic societies generally more so in the western cultures um but we learn from this and that you know the economy and money isn't everything and we perhaps don't need quite as much as we thought we did uh how can we use technology in a helpful way rather than i've learned seven zoom meetings in one day is far too much <laughs> yeah um so really those meaningful connections i think um is a massive opportunity uh for us as a collective human being society i love that oh, that's so good that feels like almost refreshing um <laughs> for joining me today hannah i really appreciate your time and what you have to share and I feel like a lot of the stuff that came up, I could have gone into like down the rabbit hole with and just be like, yes, let's talk more about this. But um, yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on and having a chat to me about these things. You are more than welcome. Thanks for letting me, you know, paddle around in these different topics. It's been a lot of fun. Cheers. My pleasure and best of luck for uh, Tokyo 2021. Thank you. <laughs>